Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by expressing my happiness of being here today and my gratitude to all those who made possible this event. Mosaic Glass or Murine, as we say in Venice, became the other side of my life when I began research on these miniature masterpieces together with Gianni Moretti and other friends of the Association for the Study and Development of, culture, of Muranese Culture. We started almost by chance, examining some specimens and becoming aware that we knew, we knew nearly nothing about these fascinating objects. We visited the deposits of the Murano Glass Museum, its archives. We asked some collectors and antique dealers and all Muranese families to look in the back of, of forgotten drawers and understood that there was a hidden treasure waiting to be discovered. After many years of work, we discovered it, and, we, and eventually we managed to organize a great exhibition at the Palazzo Ducale in Venice in 1990. The second part of this story begins two years ago, when, as you know, coming back from a lecture at the convention of Paperweight Collector Association in St. Louis, I paid a visit to the Cornell Museum of Glass, a sort of mecca for scholar, glass scholars. I was friendly welcomed by Dr. David Whitehouse and had the opportunity to visit your splendid collections. Since I, has, I had brought with me some of my murine to show them to the participant of the paperweight convention, I was happy to show them also to Dr. Whitehouse and his colleagues. Some months later, I received a letter from, doc, from Dr. Whitehouse to let me know the project of the museum to organize the 1995 exhibition on the story of mosaic glass, which includes, of course, Venetian Murine. I was happy to take this opportunity and to give my contribution to the success of this event. And for that, I want to thank very warmly Dr. David Whitehouse. Last of all, I want to thank my wife, Lore, who didn't leave me alone neither on this occasion. <laughs> Her presence in these 26 years of common life has, has been always precious to me. And it is now in a particular way, because Lore speaks and understands English very well. And she can, therefore, help me to, to communicate with you. In fact, as you have already heard, I speak English quite badly. I do apologize for this, and I promise you that in change for your kind comprehension, I shall in turn be very comprehensive with those thousands of Americans who come to Venice and don't speak nor understand Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's just go to the topic of this lecture. The history, oh, yes. The history of mosaic glass, or murine, begins very early in the history of glass and reaches its period of great splendor during the two century before, centuries before and after the birth of Christ. This is a, your bowl. And these are beads of the same period. But as a consequence of the invention of glass blowing, this technique was failing rapidly, rapidly in this use because it required a lot of time and great skill. And with some exception, it will take 1,400 years to see in Murano a new production of glassware encased in Murine. However, it must not, not be forgotten that roads with various types of Murine continue to be produced by the bead makers we worked over the flame of a lamp. Around the end of the 15th century, in the furnace of Maria Barovier in Murano, were produced the glass item, items with small sections of a key encased on the surface. This cane was the famous Rosetta cane, called also star cane or chevron by the French. The production of this cane is a very simple. After gathering a first cylinder of white glass at the end of a pontil, you compress it into an open star-shaped mold. 
then you got a layer of blue glass and compress it into another mold similar to the previous. Thus you continue until producing usually six layers. At this point, you attach another pontil at, at the other extremity of the cylinder and you begin to stretch it out in the two opposite directions. Such, you obtain an always longer and thinner cane, which will be cut into many slices according to how you need them. On the left side of the slide, you, you, see, you can see how a simple star cane is made. If the Rosetta cane was employed to, reduce, to produce beads, in the first step of the proceeding was made a hole, a hole in the cylinder making sure to keep it open until the end of the work, that is possible. The slices of Rosetta cane were utilized for making bowls, vases and other, uh, other glass wares. Here, this is a bowl that is in the display now, and another fragment found both in the Venetian lagoon. This second appearance of glass items with Murine was not much successful, and this kind of production was almost completely forgotten for several centuries. Once again, precisely in the 19th century, Murine canes returned mainly in the workshop of bead makers, and it, it was in fact a bead maker, Giovanni Battista Franchini, to whom we, we owe the revival of this art in about the 1840s. Franchini's starting point were the new filigree and mille fiore canes that Domenico Bussolini produced, produced the beginning from the 1836 year, the canes produced by Bussolini. They were an important discovery and allowed Bussolini to start a new production of glass objects as well as ornamental objects, such as, for instance, these inlaid work brooches. Giovanni Battista Franchini, 1804-1873, was not a simple craftsman, but also a very clever manager, always ready to look for perfection through innovation. Here are the portrait of Giovanni Battista and his son, son Giacomo. At this very moment, the activity of Franchini bead makers doesn't interest us. We wanted to look at Franchini as the creator of the large series of mille fiori and silhouette canes. Franchini's idea was to produce new mille fiori canes by applying the bead makers' techniques and utilize them from brooches of the new type. Uh, these ones are inlaid works. The, the next one that we will see are not inlaid, but uh, fused glass. This was uh, the, the idea of Franchini. The technical... Uh, uh, uh. Uh, Franchini obtained canes assem assembly, simple, simple rods, and getting thus canes always more complex. We call this kind of canes Canes of canes. No, sorry. Yeah, the same slide on the right uh, side, we can see how a cane of canes can be made. The technical development, development, development in theory is very simple. A cane with a star in the middle is made by putting the soft glass into a star-shaped mold. A cane with eight stars is made by assembling eight star canes, amalgamating them with the head, aid of fire, and then stretching out the new cane until the desired diameter will be reached. With this technique, Franchini obtained extra extraordinary results, succeeding to produce a long seri series of very beautiful and very complex canes there exists a cane composed with 155 constituent canes. Here we have some specimen of the Franchini canes. 
Among these murine, you can observe the famous Franchini Rose. This murine was re were realized between 1840 and 43 and copied by the, by the glass manufactory of Clichy after the Vienna International Exhibition in 1945, becoming then the more famous Clichy Rose. Giovanni Franchini, in collaboration with, with his son Giacomo, had the idea to, to try to make cane showing animals, gondolas, and eventually real portraits, instead of simple geometric and millefiori patterns, as were the millefiori canes uh, until this uh, period. The brilliant idea of Franchini, simple, like all, all ingenious things, was to prepare molds of different shape, like a dog, a duck, a school, and so on, and to create thus canes that encases various simple silhouettes. These are the more simplest cane of Franchini that, that you can find later in the Baccarat production, for instance. It's very simple to make a cane like this. In the same way, they prepared an entire series of all the letters of, of the alphabet, alphabet, and the next step was assembling simple canes to compose more complicated canes, and this is very evident in the case of word and uh, date canes. Preparing assembly the, the simple uh, canes with uh, each letter, you have, you have the, the word, you see, th these are canes not, not yet uh, amalgamated with the fire. Another date. More difficult is composing the more complex patterns as the rows. Here you have a drawing showing to you the different stages of, uh, of the, the work. Here. This is, this is a first cane, really, the first is this one. Then you have this cane, and this cane is here. And these are, yeah. There are many different canes, you see? You can see very well that this is a cane. The same you can see for a moon. This is a, the eye. Huh? And then this. The gondola. This. <laughs> the Murina Millefiori were produced during the years 1840-43, whereas the silhouette Murine were produced between 43 and 45, and perhaps for some more years. The masterpiece of this kind of production is the Murina with the Rialto Bridge. At first, the master prepared a great number of simple... Ah, this is a gondola. 22, yes. Here are the Molina with uh, the Rialto Bridge. At first, the master prepared a great number of simple canes. After that, he assembled them pro progressively, building up the whole design step by step. This Molina was created between 40. Uh, 6 and 48, another version, the different canes used for building the Rialto Bridge. Franchini employed the Millefiori and Silhouette cane for the production of brooches. You have the brooches. You see, this is not an inlaid work, but is a fused uh, glass. And they made a, a long se series of this kind of work.
and also knife handles and seals. You can see the Murine with the, the gondola, the date, and the other Mille Fiori. Another interesting thing is the undeniable fact that Franchini contributed in a decisive way to the birth of paperweights. In the 40s of the last century, the most important person in Muranese glass production was Pietro Bigaglia. Between 1842 and 47, he owned also a glass factory for blown glass, and its production represented the transition point between the crisis of the first decades of the century and the revival in the second half of the 19th century. Franchini supplied Bigaglia with the beads of his lamp work workshop and in 1945 he also supplied Bigaglia with some of his murine. Bigaglia utilizes this murine to produce the paperweights he brought to the International Exhibition of Vienna in 1845 where he won a gold medal. It might be interesting to observe that we know from documents conserved in Venice that Bigaglia produced the two types of paperweights, the, the so-called of fine work, this one, which we can see the, the different murine of, uh, of Franchini, eh? there are many, and another called of common quality, in which ribbon twist and spiraled filigree rods are scrambled together without any order. Now, since the fine work paperweights were being presented as a novelty in 1845, it is possible to think that the common quality paperweights have been realized before, and perhaps in 43 or 42, when Bigaglia opened his glass factory for blown filigree glass. We know paperweights of Bigaglia, including Franchini, date Keynes, 1845, 46, 47. In 47, Bigaglia closed his glass factory and suspended also the paperweight production. This is the reason why the, the, date, Ke Ke <laughs> the date Keynes of uh, Bigaglia paperweights ends at 47. But the work of Franchini, on the contrary, continued, and especially the work of Giacomo, the son of Giovanni Battista. The Rialto Bridge Cane can already be considered a masterpiece. Giacomo, however, wanted to try the unbelievable, driven into this enterprise by the love of his young heart. In fact, he tried to compose in a glass cane the portrait of a young girl with whom he was probably in love, Angelina. <clears throat> he achieved this result between 1845 and 46, and of this work we know several models. This is the word. Another one. This is less beautiful. In 1847, he made the cane with the face of Pius IX, the Pope who in the first years of his reign raised the enthusiasm of the Italian patriots here in two plagues. Both the, the first uh, portraits of Angelina and Pius are quite simple. Giacomo's real aim, however, was still more ambitious, to realize the portrait of the King of Italy, Vittorio Emanuele II. Here the, a picture of the king, and so forth, how to say, immediately, <laughs> the Murina. Uh, eh? You see? This was an extremely complicated undertaking, which required the preparation of a large number of simple canes. Because you, you must uh, observe that uh, this is a cane composed by perhaps 25 simple canes. 
This uh, is a cane composed by one cane here, another cane here, composed by canes, another here, and so on. Such detail is a cane. The eye, of course, the nose, the mouth. It's very, very complicated. He worked for four years, and finally, in 1860, he achieved the splendid results. There are some canes of the details. This nose really doesn't belong to the, the king. It is the nose of Cavour. We will see. <laughs> this is the nose of the king. Yes. After the king, it was the turn of his general, Garibaldi. This is always the king. Here, Garibaldi. There exist several kings of this portrait. Another one. This is the king only of the face. And then the prime minister of the new Italy, Cavour. Yeah, Cavour. Of this cane, we have also the cane with uh, only the head. You see? You see the nose? Here yeah, the nose. And the eye. Yeah. At the end, the th three protagonists of the new Italy were put together in one cane and, and then reduced to the quite ama amazing, amazing, amazing size. The diameter of this cane is three millimeters. Three. And in spite of that, the silhouette are perfect. And here is a brooch, which is the same three portraits, which is showing us another possible use of these precious murine. After the three Italians, Giacomo Franchini did the portrait of the French king Napoleon III. Of this cane too, we have several canes showing details of the portrait. First a drawing. Ah. These three canes are one, only one cane that we found here. This is a part of the ribbon. This here and here. Hmm. Again. Medals. A polette. Ah. Giacomo Franchini last masterpiece. In, in 1863 was a portrait of the Austrian Emperor Franz Josef. Here again a drawing, perhaps, yes. You see the different medals. Some details, no, the portrait. Yeah, some details. Here hand, ends the story of the Franchinis. In the history of glass, they have to be remembered for many reasons. They brought the Venetian Mille Fiori to a bloom, if I may say so, which since then took of thousands and thousands of form and colors. They created canes of such a perfection never since achieved. Giacomo portraits, in particular, are still today unexcelled masterpieces. Lastly, they didn't create these marvels in a Muranese glass factory, but in a small bead maker's workshop by the means of the flame and small quantities of glass. The splendor of the Murine of, of the Farnese of Murano, on the contrary, begins with Vincenzo Moretti, 1835-1901. -19 he worked in the Venice and Murano Glass Company, established by Salviati in 1867, and he proposed himself to imitate the Murine of, of Roman age 
which were brought to light by the archaeological excavation carried out in this period. He had ah, yeah. He had his first results in 1873 with a series of mosaic cane made up with a great number of simple roads. Uh, this technique is, uh, uh, this, these are cane of canes. He made a simple cane and then assembled them. And, yes. There are some canes that, that are, that require some work like this. Some other are very simple, geometric, uh, a monochromatic cane, you see. Uh, the technique was to make the simple cane, then assembly, assembling them cold, make a cylinder, wired with the co copper, and then put in the furnace and heat the very, very slowly until the glass be, kept, get uh, soft and then you stretch the, the cane. Then followed many other canes reproducing exactly the Roman age canes, both with flowers and leaves and other patterns. Here a tulip. Here the technique is another one, more complex, because the cane is uh, built with uh, hot glass, hot and fluid. Fluid glass, yes? Okay. A tulip, and you can say the same in the old uh, Roman age uh, bowls or, or dishes. The butterfly, a little bird that is in exhibition here, flower, flower also uh, the, is in exhibition with the, the more, small bowl of the, the museum. In 1878, he presented in Paris a series of bowls and dishes that reproduced the old Roman ones and achieved an enormous success. This is yours. It's a very bad slide, but a very beautiful dish. Look. He was able, able to prepare a lot of different canes, and there still exists a beautiful set of samples of these canes that is preserved in Venice. He made a sort of sample, like a, a, a tailor, of different uh, kind of canes. He can... Ah, Vincenzo Moretti's son, Luigi, 1867-1946, also wanted to follow the example of Giacomo Franchini and decided to give life to a new ser series of portraits. This technique is different from that of, of Franchini. Moretti, in fact, utilized a lot, a lot of monochrome rods of different colors and shapes, and like a mosaic worker, composed the whole design. Thus, it, thus it, he obtained a cylinder with a diameter of about 10 centimeters and 20 centimeters high. The cylinder, <coughs> bound tightly together with a copper wire, was heated up very slowly, and when the glass was getting soft, it was stretched out to a long cane. In this way, Luigi Moretti realized between 1888 and 1894 several portraits, beginning with the one of his father, Vincenzo. Ah. 
sorry. Ecco. His father Vincenzo. Then came the King Victor Emmanuel II. You see the difference between this portrait and the other one due to the different technique. You can see here much more than the, in the other the, the limit of, of each singular uh, cane. You see the cane no? are, that are utilized. And Then came the king uh, uh, Umberto I, the first, uh, the new king of Italy. The crown prince Victor Emmanuel is not very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> In reality, it was not very beautiful. No. <laughs> A new kind of Garibaldi must be noted that the Murina here is inlaid in a ring of the Venturina. The ring is not, eh, the ring is not part of, of the cane. The cane ends here. Pope Lion the thir Thirteenth, not very beautiful, no. The German Emperor William. The face of the Virgin. Virgin, particularly beautiful and interesting is the Murina of Christopher Columbus. It was realized a hundred years ago in 1892 on the occasion of the fourth centenary of the discovery of America. One year later, when the Venice and Murano Glass Company opened a glass factory in Chicago on May 18th, all the 400 guests had as a gift one of these of these tiny but pre precious portraits of Columbus. The Murano Glass Company utilized the Vincenzo Moretti canes for the production of its precious Murine glass. Luigi portrait, Luigi's portraits, on the contrary, were a test of expertise and didn't have any practical utilization. We can, however, say that some of these canes had the fortune to enter in paperweights. One of these is conserved in the Backstrom Marine Museum and is, and he is published in the wonderful book of Geraldine Casper, number 363. It contains the portraits of Crown Prince Victor Emmanuel. Let's, let's now have a look at the th third family of Murine makers, the Barovier. They are a very ancient family which is active in Murano glass working since the 14th century. A barovier who left us some beautiful Murine is Giuseppe, 1853-1942. He started his activity as a glass maker at the age of 14 in the new factory of Salviati. He took participate in the reproduction of ancient glass following the instru instruction, instruction of his uncle Giovanni. To Giovanni can be ascribed this dish, conserved in the Museum of Murano, where are showing up a lot of different canes, one of which, of which can be observed see in detail. In this case, too, the aim was to reproduce the reproduction of the Murine of the Roman age, these murine have been realized between 1881 and 1891. The young Giuseppe <coughs> quite certainly cooperated with his uncle making this murine. His, his most beautiful works, however, came much later, namely with the ev event of the Art Nouveau in the first decades of the 20th century. Here are some flowers of the Giuseppe Barovier Gardens. Nice, eh? Mm. Yeah. With this murine, he composed the dishes, bowl, bowls, and vases. 
little vase. Okay. Barovier masterpiece is a murina which is a, which represents by itself a complete work. Also, it measures only about three centimeters. It is more precious than a picture, the peacock. Here, the peacock. Technically, the murina is extremely complex since it was crafted with a mixed techniques, technique. The feathers of the peacock tail, back and head were assembled from canes which had been preformed at the furnace without the aid, the aid of any molds and, and on which <laughs> sorry, ribbons of color were overlaid one at a time. Was not clear? No? See, more or less. However, the finished Murina was not the product of the mosaic that had, had been assembled called for individual canes, the procedure followed by Luigi Moretti. Rather, it was constructed at the mouth of the furnace by attaching four stripes of white glass forming the center of the Murina. You see? This is the center. You start here. <coughs> Attaching four stripes of white glass forming the center of the Murina to a pontil, pontil and building up the picture around it. The first tail feathers. And then the rest. The body and then the remaining details. Before being added to the cylinder that was taking shape, performed the pieces of glass were of course reheated until they soft, softened and the cylinder was continually returned to the furnace to prevent it from cooling. With the Barovier, the making of Murine began to assume a new role in Muranese glass, ma glass making. They became colored elements of the more compl complex pattern that were utilized in the same way as a painter used the strokes of a paint. Yeah. Thus, the Murine started a new history, adding a new chapter every day. Concluding, let me pay an homage to Murano, showing you these two Murine made in 1923. The rooster is a symbol of Murano. And with these roosters, I bring to all of you the greetings of Murano and Venice and our best wishes for your splendid exhibition. Thank you for, all, for your attention and patience. Very complicated, yes. Are there questions of the professor? Yes, please. Yes, professor, would I, you explain the process of aventura? Aventurina? Yeah, aventurina, yeah. Ah, uh, this is another lecture. <laughs> uh, in two words, aventurina, uh, as the, the words say, aventura is a chance. Yeah? Is a, is a, a sort of glass uh, made perhaps uh, in the 16th century in which uh, are uh, many crystal of copper. The copper. Uh, yeah? Copper, yeah. Cop copper. 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 Uh, the procedure, procedure is to, to fuse the glass, then uh, shut the, the furnace and let it uh, cooling. 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 Cool up. Cooling. Then, uh, in this uh, way, the, the copper that is uh, in, in form of uh, metallo, not metal, metal puro, non ossimi. Metal, metal copper. Yeah. Metal, 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 metallic form, 
uh, begin, uh, begin in the form of a crystal and give this uh, appearance of gold because uh, the light reflects on the, the crystal of the cup. Probably made to imitate the, like, a, like a stone, like pyrite, yeah. a hard stone. We don't know. We don't know how no. and, and exactly when and why Aventurina was made. It, it, it made her appearance, its appearance in the uh, 16th century. It, but they used other colors, did they use other colors as well? There exists the red, the Aventurina that we have seen, yes. and the blue that is more uh, red. Yes. The green, the green is made also green. Uh, there is a, a sort of Venturina that is not a Venturina, made with chromo. Chromo? Chromo. chromo. But the it's not... Is, the French <coughs> is green. Uh, Sometimes, uh, yes. yes. But the more, the more uh, usual is uh, the red one. <coughs> and it was very much uh, used in the last century, Venturina, for inlays, because uh, you usually you works uh, aventurina as a cold uh, glass. Mm -hmm. You put in slices for inlays. You can use also for uh, uh, blown glass. So you, you have to reduce the, the stone of glass in pow powder. 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 Yeah. Then you collect with the oak, the oak uh, mass of glass. And you have a layer of aventurina in your glass. When, when did they, it's uh, a, a little different subject, but at what point, I suppose, when did they start, I've seen examples, Muranis examples, and also Bohemian examples, where they would blow that. And, you know, they would do a vessel and it would start out in the form, by the time they got to the lip of the vessel, it was very distorted because it was blown. I'm afraid I have not understood the question. The question is when? Yes. They, they were, there's Miller Fury that, that's obviously been blown using vessels. Yes. And, and the... Uh, we don't know exactly the, the date. We know that uh, there was a Miller Fury made by Mussolini in the first uh, uh, 30s, made uh, in Bohemia by uh, Fuchs, uh, made in, uh, in France, we know, uh, we don't know, and perhaps we are not uh, extremely interested to discover who was the first. Right? Uh, probably, Venetians say, Venetians were the first, uh, and the same say the other. So, <laughs> it's quite uh, normal. It, anyway, it was in the beginning of the 30, 30s of the last century. And uh, Fuchs, perhaps, was uh, the first, but Bussoli, in his own works, he uh, writes, and he writes that uh, in 1943, uh, I think, that he was the first, the first in, in front of the French. We don't know exactly. Anyway, it was uh, the, the beginning of the 30s, in the last uh, century. Then, then the, the French uh, had the, the major development, the, the Baccarat and the uh, Tichy. Uh, also, the, Fra the Franchini made his uh, first case, military case at the beginning of the 40s, after Mussolini.
Well, since I, I seem to have been presented as the person who will oversee a major change in the library, I'm happy to say that the comments I've prepared may uh, comfort you in that they present me as a person with continuity to the past of this organization. It is an honor and a privilege to speak to you today as head librarian of the Reikau Library I know that the fellows have a long-standing special relationship with the library, and I am looking forward to talking to each of you individually. I've chosen to introduce myself to you as a group by sharing some of my more or less embryonic thoughts about the Reikau Library. It strikes me that at this moment in time, I am able to offer a unique perspective on the library. The fact that I am so new gives me a degree of distance and objectivity similar to that of a consultant. At the same time, during the past six months, the very positive impressions of the library staff and collections, which I took home from my interview visit, have only been strengthened so that I care intensely about the library's future. It seems to me that the key to the Reikau Library's future and actually the link between its future and its past is its status as the library of record for the art and history of glass. What does this phrase library of record really mean in terms of the Reikau Library's collections and services? In 1951, when the library of the Corning Museum of Glass was established, its stated goal was to collect, in conjunction with the already existing library of the Corning Glass Works laboratories, all possible written and published work on the subject of glass. Even at this early date, the library's first librarian, Catherine Deneen Mack, was able to write, this is a quote, the library of the Corning Museum of Glass and the library of the Corning Research Laboratories combine in one location the most complete range of books and manuscripts dealing with the subject of glass in the world. The vision of Arthur A. Houghton, Jr. of a library of record for the art and history of glass may well have had its origins in Mr. Houghton's experience at the Library of Congress, where from 1940 to 1942, he served as curator of rare books, only the second person to hold this office. The concept of a library of record a repository for a comprehensive collection to be preserved permanently and made available to researchers could not be better exemplified than by the practices of the Library of Congress. It is interesting that while Mr. Houghton was himself a supreme bibliophile and collector of rare books and manuscripts, he apparently did view these treasures as deserving of use. In endowing the Houghton Library at Harvard University, where I had the pleasure of serving as a cataloger before becoming associate librarian of the Fine Arts Library at Harvard, Mr. Houghton chose to give his name to a rather heavily used rare book and manuscript collection within an academic library system. In 1951, the establishment of a library of record for the art and history of glass was essentially a generous initiative. The commitment to develop and maintain such a library was a gift to glass scholars, collectors, dealers, and artists who could thereby meet most of their informational needs through a single source. And while the dissemination of information and outreach to geographically distant researchers has been part of the library's mission from the beginning, 
No one could have foreseen almost 45 years ago how much more important the whole enterprise of a library of record for the art and history of glass would be in the context of informational resources in the 21st century. To summarize the current situation in very dramatic terms, Harvard University's libraries now depend upon the Reikow Library. Let me explain. I'm using Harvard as an example of a huge, very wealthy and prestigious research library system which has had a long-standing tradition of self-sufficiency. I'm using Harvard as my example because as associate librarian of the Fine Arts Library at Harvard from 1983 to 1994, I have a first-hand knowledge of the way the external forces which affected all research libraries in the 1980s affected that institution. In the 1980s, the combination of increasing publishing activity worldwide, rising costs of publications, especially periodicals, decreasing purchasing power of the dollar abroad, and cutbacks in federal funding for higher education made comprehensiveness and self-sufficiency simply too expensive to achieve. At the same time, technology was developing in such a way that individual libraries were becoming electronically connected to each other and their users, and there were new means of reproducing, storing, and transmitting information. The result of all these forces affecting the research library community was not surprising, not surprisingly, an explosion of enthusiasm for a division of labor in collection development among libraries. The term cooperative collection development is one commonly used to describe the efforts of groups of libraries, usually clustered geographically, to deliberately distribute responsibility for acquiring materials and to allow the users of each library to consult or borrow from the collections of all. In the literature of the library profession, the issue is often labeled, quote, ownership versus access, end quote. This is where Harvard's dependency upon the Reikow Library fits in. For the Harvard Fine Arts Library, neither the university's fine arts curriculum nor the collections of the Fogg Art Museum can justify the development of an in-depth collection on the art and history of glass. The expenditure of funds on the purchase and processing of less substantial publications or very costly antiquarian titles in this subject area and the use of scarce book stack space for such relatively little used materials would indeed be wasteful. The expectation or even assumption is that Harvard does not need to own these materials because the Reikow Library is acquiring them and Harvard can have access to the Reikow Library's holdings through interlibrary loan or document delivery service. Numerous other research libraries similarly depend upon access to our collections. In January of 1994, just very recently, the Reikow Library began its participation in an online interlibrary loan process. That is, requests to borrow materials and replies to those requests are transmitted via computer rather than, as in the past, by mail or telephone. The Reikow Library's policy has been to fulfill requests almost always by means of microfiche copies, only if the title cannot be found elsewhere by the borrower. So in effect, this policy ensures that we are lending materials related to the subject of glass. And it means that our interlibrary loan activity serves as an interesting indicator of our importance as owners in the research community. In the 10 years from 1983 to 1993, the average number of interlibrary loan requests filled annually by the Reikow Library was 225. In the half year following our debut in the online library loan system, we fulfilled 469 requests. And this year, in the 10 months from July of 1994 to the present, we have already fulfilled 694. So putting aside the problem of the increased staff, uh, the time that this level of service necessitates, these numbers should be welcomed as a confirmation of the value of what we are doing 
and I only wish sometimes that we could ask each borrower about the nature of his or her research project. I suspect that the increase in requests for materials in our collection is not solely the result of the ease of online communication. My experience overseeing collections of art information resources at Tufts University in the 1970s and later at Harvard is that scholarly interest in what have traditionally been referred to as the decorative arts has increased significantly in the past 20 years. As the study of objects of beauty has shifted away from an emphasis on connoisseurship toward an exploration of the social, cultural, and economic context of these objects' production, those objects that combine beauty and utility have gained status as keys to understanding the forces at work in each art historical period. Of course, glass objects and their production are included in these investigations. Let me now move on from the preceding somewhat abstract observations on the Reykjavik Library to talk more specifically about some items mostly newly acquired from the library's collections. I do hope that my remarks, brief remarks thus far, uh, begin to convey to you my enthusiasm and pride in joining you to take Arthur A. Houghton Jr.'s vision into the 21st century. The idea of a library of record for the art and history of glass, which was an ambitious but internally driven mission in 1951, is now a commitment and a promise to an international community of scholars. I have some things to show you in the billiard room. <laughs> I have heard about that request. I didn't know who made it, but um, it, it seems a valid thing to be requesting. And uh, I don't know that I'm in a position to offer to do it at this moment, but I, I think it would be a nice thing to do mm -hmm. if we can possibly staff the library to do it. Normally, it closes at 5, and you would like it to be open till. Is it evening or is it generally, the weekend? Because generally, the attendees at seminar are so busy with those functions that mm -hmm. one doesn't have uh, normally have the time to uh, have access to the library. Mm -hmm. Jane, we actually tried that several years ago. I think we kept it open to seven. I can't remember if it was seven or eight, mm -hmm. and uh, only two people came to the room. So the librarians felt that uh, it was. You know, they were staying for a relatively limited audience, but I'd like to try to meet your needs somehow. Okay. okay. I feel maybe I'm preaching to the converted, but I. <laughs> <laughs> Should we follow you? 